also to Exeter TV for making it possible to share on Zoom and on Channel 98 and on Facebook. Uh, before we get to the main event, I have a couple of announcements. In keeping with tonight's theme of the Robinson Female Seminary, in the coming weeks, our meeting room will feature a few photos and artifacts relating to the school. We hope you'll wander in during our open hours to take a look. Our next monthly meeting will be Tuesday, February 7th, and it will be virtual only. There is a Zoom registration link on our website, on our website, exeterhistory.org slash events. We hope to see you online or on Facebook or Channel 98. And now, a brief introduction to tonight's speaker. It's always a pleasure for me to introduce my friend and coworker, Barbara Rimkunis. Barbara grew up in Falmouth, Maine, and earned her bachelor's and master's in history at the universities of Maine and New Hampshire, respectively. In her past lives, she has worked as an archeologist and in patient registration at the Exeter Hospital ER. Most importantly to us, she has been the curator of the Exeter Historical Society since 2000. You've probably read her historically speaking columns and or seen her present other programs and or caught her in one of our more than 120 Exeter History Minutes. She's pretty awesome. Barbara? Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Before we get started tonight, it's good to know where we're coming from. If you're watching us virtually, tonight's talk is coming to you from Meskwamskuk, which is now called Exeter in the Dakana, the traditional ancestral homeland of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples, past and present. We acknowledge and honor with gratitude the Alnabak, the people who have stewarded Nidakana and its Aki, Nibi, Olakwakak, and Owa'asak, the land, the waterways, the flora, and fauna throughout the generations. It is good to know where we're standing. So tonight's program is the Robinson Female Seminary, longtime school here in New Hampshire. And before I get too far into it, looking at this crowd who is here tonight, how many Robinson Seminary alums do we have? Give a clap if you're like quite a few. <laughs> I'd say at least 10. And there's probably more um, women who have attended this school who are watching us virtually tonight. So we, we, we love the alumni. The Alumni Association of the Robinson Seminary has put out two books over the years that I have relied on heavily for tonight's program. One is a small book called On Ever Robinson, which was part of the school song, that line, correct? I'm looking over at my source material. Okay, good. Um, this book is no longer published. We only have a few copies of it left at the Historical Society. We have digitized it, so if you are doing research about women's seminaries or schools and you want access to it, just send us an email and we can give you access to it. The other is the um, Alumni Association list of graduates. I counted them, and there have been 1,948 women to graduate from the Robinson Female Seminary throughout its history. That is not counting the many, many, many women who went to the school and did not graduate for whatever reason, or in its final years, the women who started at the seminary as girls and then moved on to Exeter High School after unification. We have a number of people who have done that as well. They also had the Robinson Seminary experience, even if it was only for a short time. So let's get started. The Robinson Female Seminary, this is, I'm gonna give you the short history first. All right, so I'm gonna spoil the ending. It, it was a school. Um, Robinson Seminary opened to students in 1867. The first class graduated in 1870, a few years later. It was a public school for girls only, originally from the age of nine up. Now, if, when you're calculating what grade level that would be today, 
you take the child's age and you add five. So they're age nine, so they would be, or would subtract, excuse me, subtract. They're nine years old, subtract five, they're in about fourth grade. So what we would today call fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, junior high age, and uh, high school. It was a fully integrated school racially. There was never any separation of the races in Exeter, just genders. <laughs> At times, there were postgraduate courses there that you could study for an extra year if you wanted to. There was also a normal school attached. Normal school is teacher training, so that existed for a while. The final class graduated from there in 1955. We have a few 1955 grads here today. I'm looking at Elizabeth, but I really want Martha. There you are. Um, and in 1943, oh, excuse me, I already gave you the, the, the amount of people who were there, 1,943 graduates, but there were far more people who attended. Exeter was the last New Hampshire town to have single-sex schools. So let's get into it. Why? Why did this happen? How did Exeter get this school? This is a picture of the building. You'll see various photos of it over the course of the evening. It was a beautiful building. What was education in, like in Exeter before the Robinson Seminary? Well, first of all, it was co-ed. The public school system in Exeter that dated all the way back to the colonial era was always co-ed. Kids went to school together. Um, so, you know, it, it, they never, never gave much thought to separating out the genders. There were some tuition schools that were more specific. In 1826, the Exeter Female Academy was founded. That's what this flyer is from. It's frequently confused with the Robinson Female Seminary. In its advertisements in the newspaper, it calls itself the Exeter Female Seminary. So it can be very confusing. But it was actually called the Exeter Female Academy. Academy, and it was part of a larger nationwide movement of female academies or female seminaries. Seminary makes us think of a, a theological school, but it wasn't. It was, it was actually just an, a public school. Uh, not a public school, but it was not a religious school. The Exeter Female Academy did teach some hard subjects like mathematics. It was considered okay for young women to learn trigonometry and algebra. What they didn't get a lot of was sciences. Um, that was not too often taught, and they got a lot of poetry, and they had a lot of needlework. So it was a nice school, but it was more of a finishing school. Elizabeth Dow Leonard, who wrote her reminiscences of living in Exeter, she, was, she wrote it in the 1870s, but she was talking about her childhood in the early 1800s. I mean, she has memories of sugar shortages during the War of 1812, and she is a hoot to read because she's very funny, very feminist. She did not have many good things to say about the educational system in Exeter. Here's a quick excerpt from Elizabeth Dow Leonard. She said, the schools in Exeter, in my recollection, were simply wretched, especially those for girls. And I aver that in them all I for one learned nothing but the surest method of wasting time. If we have ever known anything, we owe our schoolmaster or schoolmistress anything for our information. Our knowledge was either intuitive or the reflection which shone upon us from more fortunate students. Our public schools were entirely neglected and left to the tender mercies of the most ignorant pedagogues, while our private schools were entirely superficial, and if we only paid tuition fees, were considered worthy of all praise. She later went on to teach briefly at the Exeter Female Academy, <laughs> and she does talk about how she was occasionally allowed to sit in on classes at Phillips Exeter Academy. Phillips Exeter Academy was a boys' private school. It was a preparatory school for college that was uh, founded in Exeter in 1781. So that was one alternative. It was a tuition school, and to get into college at that time for university study, you had to study Greek and Latin. Those were the things that you really needed because they were only having you learn these things for three possible professions. You could be a minister or a doctor or a lawyer. And you didn't really need it to be a doctor because doctors were hacks who just put leeches on you and cut off limbs. So they didn't really care too much about that. But minister and lawyer were the ones that they really uh, 
and, and women were not welcome in those fields. So it wasn't a lot of time spent on educating women. However, in the early 1830s, there's a movement that comes into being in the United States about educating women. I had never heard of this movement until a speaker we had last spring, Cabria Baumgartner, came and spoke to us about Rosetta Morrison, a young woman of color who lived in Exeter briefly between census records and um, went on to become a teacher in, in some schools. And so she was telling us about the seminary movement and one of the questions that arose that evening was, well, was the Exeter, you know, was our seminary, was it, was it integrated at the time? And the answer was yes, but it got me thinking more about these seminary movements. When I read up on them, I found that unlike most educational movements in the United States that begin in the Northeast, the seminary movement is more of a Southern institution. Here's a woman, profoundly ex uh, educated, very well educated, who benefited from the seminary system. This is Mary Mary Todd Lincoln, far more educated than her husband, who only got a year or two of schooling at best, and yet she knew it all. She, she was the person in the relationship who had this, the, the book learning, if you want to call it that. So she benefited from it tremendously. Exeter Public Schools, however, gave very little thought to this, and the public schools were, as, as um, Elizabeth Dow Leonard said, pretty basic. <laughs> And they con contained, uh, you know, they were generally co-ed, and there was no thought given whatsoever to breaking it down and, and improving it. The high school is created in 1848. That's when Exeter High School was founded, so before the seminary. And boys and girls could attend there. But most boys didn't attend high school. There was not a lot of reason for it. Most of the boys who were going to go to college would go to Phillips Exeter Academy. The fees were a lot lower then. <laughs> And, um, and if they weren't going to go to college, there was no point in them doing much more than learning some basic bookkeeping math and writing skills, so most didn't. And then in 1865, the town of Exeter gets word that they have been left an enormous amount of money to start a women's school for girls, rather, because this is, you know, high school era. And it was from William Robinson. The town gave a collective, who was that? <laughs> who was this guy? I had no idea who this guy was. And here's the will. It's very specific. Okay? He, he, he wound up leaving $200,000, which is a lot of money for this time period. And it's 1864 when he dies, 1865 when the will is proved and it goes to, to Exeter. And he was a southerner. He lived in Georgia. So how did he manage to keep his fortune? Okay, anyway, the income of this property, and no more, to be appropriated forever to the support of a suitable and proper, and for suitable and proper teachers for the only and sole instruction of females. He always calls women and girls females. I most respectfully suggest that in admitting applicants and all other things being equal, always give the preference to the poor and the orphan. I expect the town of Exeter will provide a suitable building, it's going to come up again, for a female seminary and the interest on the amount of money it will receive from my estate will be appropriated for the payment of suitable teachers. That was his goal. And he does explain in the will, in my poor opinion, there is altogether too much partaking of the fancy in the education that females obtain. And I would most respectfully suggest such a course of instruction as will tend to make female scholars equal to all the practical duties of life, such as a course of education will enable to compete and successfully too with their brothers throughout the world. I have given my might for this pur purpose, and if good comes of it, I shall not have lived in vain. What a champion for women. You read that and you think, what a wonderful man. Hold your clapping because I'm going to ruin that. <laughs> heard that William Robinson cared deeply about the education of women because when he was a boy, he went to Phillips Exeter Academy and he would bring home his studies and his sisters would crowd around him and want to hear about this. The real story is a little more complex. 
Um, he was born in 1793. He was the second child of William Robinson, who was a hatter, and his wife, Mary Ann Levitt. They got married in March of 1792, and their first child was born in September of 1792, because there's nothing new in the world. William was born the following year, and then his sister Mary Ann was born in 1800. He went to Phillips Exeter Academy from 1807 till 1810. His older brother did not attend. And after classes were done, they didn't used to graduate you from Phillips Exeter. They used to say, you're done. <laughs> and if you wanted proof of that, you would have to get a letter. Uh, but they didn't have like a graduation ceremony. After graduate, after leaving, finishing, uh, he was apprenticed to a printer in town for a while, and then he left Exeter after seven years with his friend who lured him to go to Georgia. And in Georgia, he worked at a clerk in a, in a shop. After a while, he bought the shop. Then he began to deal as a wool merchant. That's where the story usually ends. <laughs> he was a wool merchant, and he married well, and he amassed a fortune. Well, he's in Georgia and he's dealing actually with cotton. And we all know what happens when you're working with cotton. So we found him on the census. On the right-hand side is the census of free inhabitants of Georgia. At the very bottom, you see William Robinson and his wife, Anna. And there's nobody else listed in the household. They never had any children. So you think, oh, that's a sad story. This man massed this great wealth. He had no one to leave it to. He left it to Exeter. That's nice. Until you get to what's called the slave schedule, which is a separate part of the census. And there you find William Robinson in the 1850 census, and he has 13 enslaved people between the ages of 4 and 65. Seven women and girls, six boys and men. You'll note they're listed by their age and their perceived race, either black or mulatto. What you don't see are their names because they're property. He writes in a letter to his brother Jeremiah, and Jeremiah lived here in Exeter, and they wrote back and forth a lot, mostly concerned about health. You can read these letters and think to yourself, this man is a complete hypochondriac. But remember, you could like die from a bug bite back then, so he had reason to be concerned. He couldn't tolerate the cold weather of New England, but he also didn't like the heat of Georgia, so he traveled a lot. And in 1853 is when he wrote his will, and he specifically wrote it because he wasn't sure if he was going to make it back from a European trip he was going on. In one of his letters, he complains about how vast his household has become. He has all these dependents on him, and although he rarely talks about his wife, he does talk about all the horses and cattle that he's supporting, plus the 15, he always calls them Negroes when he's writing about them, the 15 Negroes who he has to feed, and they're just working around the house. So, okay, maybe he only had house slaves, right? Until you get to the 1860 census, and then it gets a little bit worse. This is long after the will. In his will, by the way, he does leave some of his enslaved people specifically for his wife. He says, I give and bequeath to my wife, Anna Tabitha Robinson, all my landed property in the state of Georgia, and a Negro woman named Maria, and all her children, and my carriages and my horses, cows, carts, and all other farming implements. So they're listed in with the farming implements. In 1860, he has 32 enslaved people living on his land, all planting cotton. They were ages six months to 70. And there were 16 men and 16 women. He died in 1864. And that is buried in Georgia. And that was when the will came up. At the time he wrote the will, he thought his value was about $150,000, and it had increased after that. Now, what became of these enslaved people, we haven't been able to find out. We don't have any of their first names, so we can't, um, you know, just like they sometimes do on Finding My Roots, where they find the names. We don't have any names. And they're not grouped together in families, so we can't sort of take their ages and see after freedom, if they use the name Robinson, can we find people with the right ages? They're not grouped together in families. He groups them by male first, female second, and then by age, so we really can't tell. So we don't know what happened to Robinson's um, enslaved people, which is too bad, because it'd be kind of nice to find out what they're up to, or how they fared, or the rest of the story. So that's William Robinson, a complex person, to be sure. And this is the person that left all this money to the town of Exeter, and Exeter had to figure out how to manage this because it was quite a fortune. Just making sure I'm in the right place here. It was quite a fortune, and they had never before considered 
creating a girls' school. But they did have some models, and they knew that when you're creating a women's seminary, you did have to make sure that it was very respectable and that women were taught hard studies. So they had to make sure that there were sciences taught in mathematics and history and, and things like that. So the course of study had to be very, very academic. Sorry, I'm going through a lot of notes here because, okay. Let's move on from the slave schedules. Did the town know that this is where the money came from? Because those people were probably sold to pay for this. Did they know? They must have known a little bit. I think that they just kind of thought about it and went, la, 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 let's build a school. Um, but they were well aware of it. When the cornerstone to the school was, was um, put in place, they put Confederate money into it to acknowledge the roots of um, <laughs> William Robinson. Okay. They made some decisions pretty quickly on. They get the um, information in 1865 and they said, okay, we have to get this school going. So the first thing they did was organize. And the decision was made, all right, we will make this, first of all, Robinson doesn't speculate, it's gonna be a public school. Any of the girls in Exeter can attend this for free. Girls starting at the ages of nine can attend this school. And if girls from outside of Exeter want to attend, they can come as tuition students. $10 per term, three terms a year. So they said, let's get this going. So without having a building yet, or even land to put a building on, they opened the school in the old county courthouse. Today, that building is the Exeter Senior Center on Court Street. It used to be two stories high, so there were two stories, and the younger students were on the top floor, and the older students were on the lower floor. The first person hired to get this whole project organized was a woman named Abby Worcester, who was frequently not even acknowledged as a principal. The next thing they needed to do was make sure they got a building going. <laughs> and the town was supposed to pay for the building. So they really, you know, they inherited the money to educate the girls, but they had to have a lot of money to get this building. So they bought a lot called the Thing Lot between Main Street and Front Street. Today you can see Lincoln Street School there, but there was no Lincoln Street. Well, the kind of dirt path that was Lincoln Street at the time. That lot cost $5,000. They bought a house on Front Street near the entrance, which is still there. It was called the Gill House. That cost them $6,000. And then the Gills were kind enough to offer them a piece of land right next to that so they could build a pathway. And that lot cost $2,500 more. The architect had grand visions for this building. It was The architect was Rufus Sargent. And the builder was Albert Courier. They were supposed to keep costs down to $50,000, but they needed more. They also hired a landscape architect, um, Robert Morris Copeland, who designed the grounds. They had to borrow $90,000 from the initial Robinson Fund. They weren't supposed to do that, and they did some real tricky accounting to do that. They finally paid off that debt in 1909, but it took a long time. But the building was beautiful, the Second Empire building. It's done by the same designer who did the Moses Kent house that you see on Pine Street, the one that people call the Adams Family House. It was not, but um, it's, it is in a similar style. This is one of the earliest photos we have of it. It had a globe on top of the cupola, which is very appealing to me. There were actually four stories of space in there. There was a basement area, then there was the first floor, the second floor, and then the attic area. So they had a lot of room inside. It was designed to house about, well, well to, to educate about 250 students. Here's another view of it. You can see this is an early one because the trees aren't growing yet. That's the old train station behind it. So think of it from that angle. It was a lovely school. Everybody had to appreciate that it was a lovely school. It takes them about a year and a half to build it. And it is ready to open in 1869. So the girls who had been attending over at the Court Street building, which was cramped and crowded, and the top floor was always a little bit dicey anyway. You couldn't like put a lot of people up there, and it was the meeting room. It was always a problem. Abby Worcester was paid $800 a year to get the entire school up and running and curriculum written. 
When the school opens in 1869, they hired a new principal, a man. I'll get to the pond in a second. And he earns $3,000 a year, plus he is given the house to live in. Okay, I didn't get a chance to mention the grounds. The grounds were laid out. They had high hopes of building a boarding house for teachers and students, and they were going to build a gymnasium. They didn't have enough money for that. So they did make sure that the grounds were beautiful and they could be walked through. This was the type of physical education that girls had at that time. They were supposed to calmly walk from place to place to stretch their legs. And it was also used for nature study. So when I said that it was done by a landscape architect, there were certain types of plants that were placed there on purpose for nature study. They also took advantage of a kind of a slimy little pond area that had grown up uh, there and they dammed it off a bit and they made it into Seminary Pond, which was quite a beauty spot for a long time. It deteriorates over the years and it finally gets filled in, I think in the 1960s or 70s. It's no longer there. Seminary Pond today is the parking lot of Lincoln Street School. Every now and then it caves in and they go, I wonder why that happened. Because like, there's a pond under underneath it. Um, it's Kimmins Brook that goes under there. It goes all the way down to Swayze Parkway. But it was beautiful in its time and they could, they could actually ice skate on it and such. The first valedictorian was this woman, Cora Kent Bell. Her portrait is enormous and it hangs at the Exeter Historical Society. We call her the Dark Lady. She was the first valedictorian. She's quite a fancy lady, and she remained devoted to the school for the rest of her life, organizing alumni events and raising money. Um, she donated this little library to the seminary uh, in her will. She left some money. She was very involved in the um, organization and creation of the Exeter Cottage Hospital, which became Exeter Hospital. So I've encountered Cora Kent Bell before in doing programs. The large port painting that you see in this picture is um, Elizabeth Gardner Bugaro, another Exeter native, a famous painter, um, she donated that to the town in 1902. That is now also at the Historical Society on the opposite side from Cora Kent Bell. Please visit. <laughs> the principles of the ex of the Robinson Female Seminary. I put Abby Worcester in parentheses because she was the first person there, but she is frequently not acknowledged as a principal, even though she ran the school for the first two years and got everything organized. As mentioned earlier, she earned $800 per year. When um, Eben Stearns was hired to uh, become the principal in 1869, she was offered a teaching position. They upped her pay to $1,000 a year, and I imagine used the phrase, don't think of this as a demotion, a few too many times, because she left within the first year. So we lost a good teacher there. Um, accounts of her, particularly by Celia Shute, who was Henry Shute, the author, his sister, she attended the, the school when it was at the courthouse, and she actually really liked Abby Worcester. Had great respect for her. Eben Stearns was no shrinking violet. He was quite quite solid as a, as a principal. He was only lured away because another school hired him away. When he left, the school was then run by Harriet Payne and later Annie Killam. Both of these ladies were teachers within the school and they both were had come out of the same college in Massachusetts. They were in-house hires. The principal's house was rented out during their tenure because a single woman should not be living alone, so she gets a boarding house somewhere with no stipend. And um, the men, of course, would get a whole house because he might have a family. You had to be single to teach, so no housing for them. George Cross takes over in 1883. He served for 22 years and brought through a lot of changes. So let's... One of the things that they, uh, the, well, the, the other two ladies, um, Annie Kellum and such, uh, what they brought in was they made sure that the school was in no way um, segregated and allowed students of all colors to attend. You are looking at a picture of Medora Bailey Jason. She is the granddaughter daughter of a man named Henry Mainjoy. Henry Mainjoy was kidnapped from Senegal in 1809 and brought to Exeter by John Emery. This is his granddaughter. She took advantage of the uh, Exeter schools and went to the Robinson Seminary and was qualified to be a teacher when she graduated at the top of her class. 
she could not get hired in New England, and she moved south, and eventually she marries William Jason, who is, was uh, for quite a while the headmaster of uh, Delaware College. Um, so she went far. So take that, William Robinson. Okay, here's, here's George Cross. George Cross brought a lot of changes when he came to the school in the 1880s. It was felt that the, um, um, the curriculum was, was getting a little bit too academic. And there was an acknowledgement that not all the girls finished the program and not all the girls wanted to prep for college. So he, he thought maybe we should do some more practical courses. So he introduced more practical coursework to the Robinson Seminary. Here's the interior of one of the classrooms in 1888, serve the right. I don't even know what that means. Um, <laughs> it's, it's an intriguing thing. And, and the uh, other messages on the chalkboard do not help you trying to figure out what that message is about. So that's one of the classrooms. Here's some girls in the new laboratory. I have it listed as the chemistry lab, but then it's also listed as the biology lab. To teach girls science, you had to be very careful that you didn't teach them about sex. So to avoid the whole biology thing, they would frequently teach them botany instead. And so when they say that you learned about the birds and the bees, I think you were learning about the flowers. Um, but that was biology. And so oddly enough, there were women who became fantastic botanists during this time period <laughs> because of the the, uh, the stress that was placed on that. The young woman you see on the end here, who's a young woman of color again, this is 1895, uh, that is probably, and I'm not entirely sure about that, but I think it is most likely Ella Jackson. Her father was Junius Jackson, who was a, um, a barber in the downtown. She graduates also at the top of her class in 1897 and then moves to Boston introduced the idea of domestic arts. They introduced chemistry to improve cooking. So that was one way of making sure your academic uh, subjects are bolstering up practical teaching. And the cooking classes, which were taught by Anna Barrow, who was a rather well-noted home economics teacher who would go on to write whole cookbooks, um, was a scientific method of cooking. Gone were the days of just measuring a cup with a teacup or your mother the way, oh, heaven forbid, she just throws flour into a bowl and mixes it with her dirty hands. No, no, they did not do it that way. Cooking at the seminary was very carefully controlled, starting out with cleanliness. And they cooked on, as you can see here, they're cooking on gas um, little stoves. They're not using wood or coal or any of those dirty things that you might bring into your kitchen. The girls were taught to use gas burners. They used double boilers so that it would be uh, even heat so there wouldn't be any scorching and therefore no carbon in the food. They were taught invalid foods so that they could nurse families. I mean, it was very, very practical. By the 1920s and 30s, the girls would make a cookbook and they hand wrote it, every single bit of it. So it was dictated to them in class and they wrote it down. This is the first page. We have three of these that are identical and they're within a decade of each other. This one's 1931. And this is how to make a white sauce. Three different types of white sauce. And that is still a practical skill to know. If you can make a white sauce, you're golden. One of the recipes that they made a lot was something called salmon wiggle, which has a funny name. But it was basically canned salmon in a white sauce with peas added to it. I cooked this at home, and it went over pretty well. You serve it on toast or on noodles, whatever you want, but it, you know, not so bad. Um, but it was fun to see that we have all these different cookbooks from different girls, different types of handwriting, and yet similarities all through it. And of course, he was there when they introduced the Burlingame Bread Prize. We did a whole History Minute on this, so if you go on YouTube and just type in Exeter History Minute, the Bread Prize, Laura and I each had to eat a whole loaf of bread for this. Took one for the team. <laughs> But it was an annual event that goes right through until I think about the 1920s when we stopped seeing uh, the, the bread prize, but it um, awarded girls money prizes for the best loaf of bread. 
And then there was the normal school that he introduced. The, uh, the word normal school is teacher training, and um, before you had to get a, a college degree to teach, you could simply take teacher training courses. Some of the teachers at Robinson never did earn um, university degrees, but they frequently had gone to normal schools. So the Robinson Seminary had a normal school from 1889 to 1901. I realized that the text of this runs off the page because it was quite lengthy. You had to be 16. How would you like to have a 16-year-old teacher? Well, you'd probably have a 17-year-old teacher because she took one year of normal school training. They weren't teaching the upper grades. They were teaching um, younger kids, elementary school uh, age children. But it's still startling for us to think that you had such young teachers. But the normal school went along quite well, and they always had about six or seven uh, young women every year who would take normal school training. It did cost you extra, so that was something that even if you were, well, I don't think if you were an Exeter girl you had to pay, but uh, you did have to pay extra for it, which kept a lot of girls from taking that normal school training. The girl you saw earlier in the chemistry or biology lab um, should have gone to normal school and taken that training, but she didn't, and it was probably because at just the time she graduated, her father became quite ill. They probably didn't have enough money. There was an, an available uh, scholarship, but I, I guess she wasn't eligible for that, or she felt like she should be at home taking care of him. Athletics comes to the Robinson Seminary. Um, it gets introduced under the leadership of Harlan Bisbee. He felt that, that athletics were important, plus the girls began to demand it. The idea of girls and athletics had changed over the years from walking a beautiful, beautiful shady pathway and looking at flowers, it had progressed to team sports. Basketball is first introduced in the early uh, 1900s in Exeter and the girls loved it. They had few places they could play, but they loved basketball and the first team sport really is basketball. The young woman you see on the far right, is Eleanor Churchill. Eleanor Churchill was probably the best athlete to come out of the Robinson Seminary. She could play anything. I mean, she played basketball brilliantly. She was on the hockey team. She um, did some track and field, even though they didn't have a track and field team at that time. They didn't even have varsity sports, but they gave her the first varsity letter, even without a varsity team. Um, she um, played for the American Athletic Amateur Athletics Association throughout New England and then the country and competed off and she, she did her best work at uh, baseball throwing and basketball throwing, just hurling a basketball as far as you could and she would break records. She wanted to go to the Olympics. She started swimming to try and uh, work her way up. She did not make the team but she's mentioned quite frequently as just an all-around athlete. And here's the hockey team. Field hockey became important, but only for certain places. It was one of those sports that was only played at women's colleges, the Seven Sisters colleges you hear about, Simmons and Smith and Bryn Mawr. And if I've left yours out, I apologize. Um, those colleges brought it over from England and started playing it. Originally, it was played by both boys and girls. This is field hockey, not ice hockey. Played by both boys and girls. And then it becomes mostly a girls' sport, which is amazing because it is so incredibly violent. Okay, I mean, who's played field hockey? hockey here. All the women are like, yes, I still have the concussions. Um, because it's like soccer without, it's like a, with, a, with a weapon. I mean, it's, it's just this hard mallet and you're not supposed to raise it higher than this, but yeah. Um, but it's very popular at Robinson Seminary. They had two issues with it though. They didn't have a field and there weren't a lot of teams that they could play. If you're going to have varsity sports, you need other high schools or schools to have teams. And they frequently didn't find that. They'd play a YMCA team or a town team, and it was very hard getting, uh, getting this started, but once it did, there's no surprise that Robinson Seminary was quite the field hockey powerhouse for quite some time. And I love their hats. I wonder how well they stayed on during the game. They have no shin guards. <laughs> There were other things you could do besides athletics. This is the orchestra. And sometimes the orchestra would pair up with the boys' high school, which at this point in time is called the Tuck High School because of a building donated by Edward Tuck on behalf of his father, Amos. Um, it's never legally called Tuck High School, by the way. We call it that, but it was always called Exeter High School. 
you can fight me, I have the documentation. Um, they also had a mandolin club, which was really popular. There was this real um, trend to play mandolins. It was such a popular instrument that for a while, the Phillips Exeter Academy actually had not one, but two mandolin clubs. By 1915, there were more curriculum changes. The first thing they did was they booted out the fifth and sixth graders. Too little, send them back to public school with the boys. They cost too much, and the school was getting crowded. Remember, it was built for 250 students, and just eliminating those two grades made a huge difference. So goodbye to fifth and sixth graders. They dropped German and Greek language study, which had been really important, uh, especially for girls prepping for college. Colleges weren't using it as much anymore, so by then they decided to remove but Latin requirements are lowered at this point in time instead of four years, maybe two. And they created different curriculums. There was a college prep curriculum, domestic science curriculum, a general curriculum, and then something called commercial, which added typing and stenography and bookkeeping. The world of women's work had opened up by this time, and more and more women were finding jobs outside the home, and so the skills that they would be hired for tended to be secretarial skills, and so they were making sure that these young women were trained for that. Some notable teachers. I would like to make Alice Chesley an honorary RFS grad, but she wasn't. <laughs> She was uh, one. I, she wasn't the first woman doctor. She was definitely an early woman, uh, woman who went into medicine, and she went into it late in her life. She was the medical advisor at the Robinson Female Seminary. She was also the medical advisor for the nurses' training school, and she was also the on-call doctor for the University of New Hampshire and the Robinson Seminary. She's taught um, sanitation. She taught invalid um, care. She taught the girls hygiene, basic hygiene. She was a powerhouse for many years in this town. And I love her college picture. Emily Tapley was a mathematics teacher who taught here for 28 years, longer than any of the principals. Um, she taught mathematics and she occasionally taught some sciences. I think science was her first love. I ran into her, across her when I was working on a project about 1910, the year of two comets. There was a comet that went through in January and there was a comet, Halley's Comet, that went through in May. And a lot of people confused the two when they were remembering them. They'd say, I remember Halley's Comet, we were standing in the snow. No, you weren't, because it was May. You're remembering the earlier comet. Anyway. Emily Tapley invited the entire sophomore class of the Robinson Seminary over to her boarding house so that they could see the comet that night, and the girls wrote about it. We have two different accounts of girls who actually remembered going over to Miss Tapley's house to look at the comet, and one of them commented, she knows a lot about astronomy, which surprised them because she was their algebra teacher. So um, kudos to her. <laughs> and Bessie Jakes. Who remembers Bessie Jakes? Yes, a number of people. We tried to track how long she taught at the school. And my little elves who do all of the research, who go down and have to track these things down, are pretty sure she was there from 1906. And we found a record that said she retired in 1952. Did she? Was she still there? I'm looking at the people who were there towards the 1950s. Martha, was she still there when, when you graduated? I can't remember. She is a kind of, she was an English teacher, and she was pretty strict. <laughs> People do not forget her. And during the war, when the principal had to go off and fight in the war, she stepped in to be principal. No problem. And then when he came back, she stepped right back out of it again. Um, so she was well remembered. She also didn't like posing for photos, and this was the best one I could find. <laughs> was a language teacher. She taught French and German. When they eliminated German from her curriculum because of the First World War, she specifically went into teaching French. She didn't like that there were no textbooks available that were just a nice, easy, simple French reader that wasn't written for a five-year-old. So she just wrote her own book. And it was published, and it had a, there was a sequel to it as well. Um, so she wrote this book, and it was published, and it gets used. So she wrote, write your own textbook. You know, you don't like the material, just do it yourself. 
some notable graduates. And I know that there's going to be a lot of graduates who I'm not going to be able to highlight because we only have like 10 minutes left. But here's just a sampling of some of the women who went to the Robinson Seminary. Mary Tickham was a librarian after she graduated from the seminary. She gets into clashes with uh, Melville Dewey, who was something of a misogynist, but he did invent the Dewey Decimal System. She created the bookmobile in Vermont, in rural Vermont, and that became used all across the country after that. The bookmobile from Exeter. Well done. This is Dr. Irene Morse. Her photo is a little bit odd because we took this from her passport. It was the only photo we could find about her. This was a mystery woman. We were contacted by another you know, from a, a place in Massachusetts who said, we know a lot about Dr. Irene Morse, but only after 1888. Before that, she's a complete mystery. But we heard she went to the Robinson Seminary. So we looked her up. She's not in the alumni book. We looked in the, um, the Robinson Seminary the big book, the, the sign-in book. They had this charming habit when girls first came to the seminary, up until about 1900, they used to have the girls sign in. So with a dip pen, you get to see the handwriting of these little nine-year-olds. Um, and it took us forever to find her name. And she didn't sign in as Irene Morse. She signed in as, as Rini Darling. <laughs> Because what had happened to this young woman was when she was a child in Rhode Island, her parents both died. We don't know exactly why. We've been trying to track down their, birth certif their death certificates to figure out, but it must have been something they both got. You know. And so she was um, about 10 years old and she had nowhere to live. Somehow there is a connection to Exeter that we haven't made, but she winds up in the household of Asneth Darling, who lived at the Garrison Gilman house. And uh, she lives there. Um, with um, uh, another sister who was a teacher, and she goes to the Robinson Seminary. She leaves before graduation, however, in 1881, and then she went to a normal school in Massachusetts, taught school for a while, moves to Wyoming, and then goes to medical school. And if that isn't an interesting enough story arc, during World War I, when she was in her 30s, I think, or 40s, she volunteers to serve in the medical corps and she goes to France. She is there about two months treating patients who had suffered from gas attacks. She gets gassed, survives, and comes home and spends the rest of her days working at this hospital in Massachusetts that wrote to us to say, who is Irene Morse? Robinson Seminary grad. Not grad, but she attended. We'll give it to her. And then there's Jeanette and Jeanette Talbot. The elder Jeanette, spelled J-E-A-N-E-T-T-E, -E -T -T -E, is the mother, and she is the first woman to run for the school board in the town of New in the uh, town of Exeter, and <laughs> she loses, but she ran. And later, her daughter, who is also named Jeanette Talbot, but J-E-N-N-E-T-T-E, -E, um, her daughter goes to the seminary and graduates, and marries later, and she donates a pile of money to Exeter in the, the summer of 1929. What is the next part of the story of 1929? You know, the stock market crash, and she left it all to them in, in stocks. So uh, to build a gymnasium, because she knew that there was no gymnasium, which was a problem. So they couldn't use the money because it devalued immediately. And they just sort of stuck it in an account and it ignored it and then the war hit and all this kind of stuff. And so it takes them years before they finally use that, but remember that name. So here's just some pictures of some class pictures. This is the Robinson Seminary class of 1904, but it is years before 1904. So this is probably taken in 1900 maybe or 1899. So this is just a class picture of the girls sitting in front of the school. Out of all of these students, there's probably only about 13 who fully graduate. Most of the students don't finish the course, but they're still better educated than their peers in a lot of other towns. Here's another class. This is some of those little nine-year-olds. <laughs> they were the graduating class of 1920. There's 11 of the girls in this picture do not graduate. This picture is taken in about 1912, however. So they were there right before they started throwing out all the fourth and fifth graders. So they just made it under the wire. But you can see they're, they're cute, they're little, they're lively. Here's 
a class trip. Class trips were taken all over. They frequently would go out to Fort Rock Farm for nature study walks, or they would go to Hampton Beach, which is where the girls are headed on this one with their little box lunches. And here's a group of teachers with, with Harlan Bixby, the principal. What else is you see in this picture? How many men are teaching here? None. <laughs> Oh, here's the class of 1941. There's someone in this picture that we might know. <laughs> that is Alma Plant, who is sitting in the front row. <laughs> By the late 1920s, the building was beginning to deteriorate a bit, and there was immediate, there was talk at that time, just talk, about whether or not they should reunite the two, two groups of students. Maybe we should let the boys and the girls go to school together. In the 1920s, though, with costs becoming a problem, even with this influx of what they were hoping was going to be money from Jeanette Talbot, they, they couldn't do it. It was just too expensive, so they, they shelved the idea. But in the 1930s, there was frequently more talk. Why, why don't we reunite? Them, especially when they made a big deal about the fact that Exeter was the last town in New Hampshire to, to have a boys' school and a girls' school. And they're like, why do you do that? Never mind, PEA stays all boys until the 1970s, but this was seen as kind of a little backward. But then the war hits. You can't do big projects during the war. Besides, here's some Robinson Seminary girls who saved the apple crop that fall by picking apples. <laughs> it was very important. Um, there were also boys from the high school and some boys from Phillips Exeter who did this as well. But um, there was a lot of uh, push to get students to work on projects like that. The Robinson Seminary was used as a spotting tower. It was the highest point in town. And so they had to spot for airplanes, possibly enemy airplanes coming in town, and they did this from the Robinson Seminary Tower. And out of all the people they thought they were going to use for that project, they usually thought that we'll, we'll try having World War II veterans do it. World War, um, excuse me, World War I veterans. World War I veterans were like in their 40s. And you know what happens to your eyes when you're in your 40s? You can't see anything. The people who were best at spotting planes and hearing the, mo the engines from far away were teenagers. So it turned out that they used boys from the high school, girls from the seminary, up in the tower watching for planes. It was a great system. 1948, they introduced driver's ed. This is probably my favorite picture of the seminary. It is gorgeous by this time. It is, it is after 1942, and we know that because there is actually a fire escape there. <laughs> the fire department came through and said, you, you can't hold classes on the third floor. The place is a fire trap. So they had to make some accommodations for that, but it was still difficult, uh, and the building was old. They understood that. The high school and the seminary began to share certain things. Oh, here's a picture just of some teachers. They held their um, graduation ceremonies at Town Hall for the long time, and then eventually they began to hold their graduation ceremonies with Exeter High School, but they got separate diplomas. So the girls would get a Robinson Seminary diploma, the boys would get an Exeter High School diploma. Here's Study Hall in the 1950s. Anybody see themselves in that picture? <laughs> They're all studying. We'll give them credit there. Although there is kind of a group in the back that there's always a group in the back. If you're a teacher, there's always a group in the back. Um, they look like they're goofing around a little bit. But. but they finally gave in. It takes, I think, three or four different town votes before they finally decide that they are going to have to approve the funds and merge the Exeter High School and the Robinson Female Seminary. They decided it in 1940, uh, 1954, they approved the funds, and along with it, they were going to build new elementary school. This is, as far as we know, the only photo that, at least that we have, of the Robinson Seminary and Lincoln Street School in the same location. This is the summer of 1955. You can barely see it, but in the very back, like a ghost, is the Robinson Seminary peeking through the trees, seeing the future. There's school buses in front of the school. The last weeks of that uh, term, as the class of 1955 was graduating, the girls spent the last few days moving everything out of the building and over to the new Exeter High School with the Talbot Gym, which was new construction, donated by Jeanette Talbot. 
um, was finally built. It's new, where now we go to vote, which I think Jeanette's mother, Jeanette, would have found interesting. Um, and it was dedicated as Exeter High School, so they would no longer use the phrase Tuck High School, which as I said was never a legal name, but, um, or the Robinson Seminary after that. Or so later, they took the cupola down, they started boarding up windows, they tried to reuse the building for other purposes, maybe as a cafeteria for Lincoln Street School, sometimes scout troops would meet in there. I've had scout troops, I've been in a scout troop, things get out of control. So there was little bits of vandalism that would happen. A few weeks before the end of the Robinson Seminary, the art teacher went in and took out as many things as she could. Um, most of the paintings and the art that you saw, most of which was donated, had been removed by this time. Some things just disappeared. I've been trying to track down the, the um, uh, collections of the like stuffed animals and ducks and birds that used to be in there. I haven't really figured out where it went. This is probably the final picture ever taken of the building. It's July of 1961. And in October, the building burned. And it burned all night, and it burned hot and fast, and um, there was nothing left. It was probably set. There was no electricity in the building anymore. The gas had been shut off. And that was the end of the Robinson Seminary. A lot of the alumni gathered that night to watch the fire. Helen Tufts lived right around the corner. She remembers smelling smoke around 8 p.m. and then she saw the flames from over, over the trees. It was a big, devastating fire. But then there were some alum who told me that, well, you know, it had fallen into deterioration and it was sad watching that happen. So maybe if it was gone, but then it was just gone. It was a memory after that. The high school, the new high school, just like the Robinson Seminary before it and the, and the old Tuck High School, still had seventh and eighth graders attending, by the way. So there were many women who attended the Robinson Seminary in its later days who could still say they had gone to that school, even though they didn't graduate from there. So let's remember those young women as well, young women back then. <laughs> All right, I will take any questions you might have. I know I had to leave out a lot of people. <laughs> yes? The question was, were uniforms required? No, they were not, unless you were in gym class. And I'm going to go back to that picture of the gym class. Because Harlan Bisbee, who was the principal, let's get to this one, okay. Harlan Bisbee, who was the principal who introduced athletics and gym class to, or physical education to the seminary, required the girls to wear this gym suit. It is heavy black wool pants. We have a pair at the Historical Society, which you can take a peek at. And a, what was called a midi shirt. Yeah, it's supposed to look like a midshipman's shirt. It was, it was kind of all the rage back then. He was so scandalized by these skimpy uniforms that he would follow girls to the train station to make sure that they had, were wearing a coat over it if they were wearing their gym uniforms outside of school. But there weren't any, um, there weren't any uniforms while they were there. Historical Society because I took that picture on Saturday. There was also United States money. They were trying to think of things for the cornerstone that, you know, maybe someday in the distant future people would find and they would find it unique, unusual. So they put coins in there and some Confederate, Confederates didn't make any coins. They used paper because coining was too expensive. Um, they put in an Exeter newsletter. They put in the program for, they had two big parties. When they laid the cornerstone, they had a huge parade. And then when the school opened, they had a huge parade because we just love parades here. And there were speeches and, and such. And so when the, after the fire, they pulled out the cornerstone and the, the objects that were in there were still in pretty good condition. 
and that's where this came from. So this is the actual money that came out of it. Yeah. That's watching online and you can't see. She says her mother graduated in 1942 and her class ring, which she is currently wearing, um, it, it was very simple. No stone or anything because it was during the war years. Right? Okay. It has the word elk inscribed on it. Oh, the animal, an elk. There was no mascot, as far as we can tell. We, we've wondered about that. We found a little stuffed goat. Can't figure that out. But we haven't, we haven't determined that there was a mascot for this school, unless anybody remembers one. I'm looking over at our, no, they're, they're looking at me like, no, no mascot, okay. No, they're all different. It's, uh, we have a lot of um, seminary rings in our collection, and they're very different. I think you could go to an independent jeweler in town, like Sleeper's Jewel, Jewelry, and you could kind of pick out what you wanted. So it was very different from the experience that many of us had when I was in high school in the 80s. We didn't have a choice. It was like, this is the class ring, and you're getting it. You had an option of, like, do you want it gold or do you want it silver? I mean, yeah. So I have a, I have a feeling she's picked out. We also have charm bracelets. Um, there's a a lot of uh, souvenir type items that were pressed. The building was so beautiful it gets pressed into every possible type of plate or cup or saucer, soap dish, you name it. It's got the Robinson Seminary on it. It was, it was a beautiful place, centerpiece of the town, easy to brag about. I think it was quite lovely. Yeah. That's, quite a, that's quite a great thing you've got. Yeah. <laughs> Many of the women went on to college, yes. It was, you know, in its purest form, it was a college prep school. That's what it was designed for. Because William Robinson said he wanted the women to compete with the men in all things practical. Now, why he did that, I didn't really address this, but was he a great champion for women, or was he just annoyed that he had to um, support his one sister for the rest of her life? She married young, and then her husband died when she was still quite young, and she had, I don't even know how many children. We've tried to track her down on the census records and we've had trouble finding this out um, and he his, in his letters to his brother he is forever saying I am enclosing a check for $500 for the support of our sister Mary Mrs. Page he always writes that Mrs. Page as though his brother wouldn't know who his sister was it's kind of odd but um, and he he does talk in his letters too about you know make sure Jeremiah that you educate your children in practical matters that they be able to support themselves in the future so I I think part of his wanting to champion women's education was the fact that his sister didn't have that and did not have any kind of occupation. And once she found herself a widow, really the only thing she could do was uh, run a boarding house. And he didn't feel that, that that was good enough. She should have been able to do something more. John. My great aunt Helen Tufts and her sisters and my aunt and my mother graduated. I understand they had reunions. Oh, yes. <laughs> I don't, I, the, um, he's asking, uh, what about reunions? Yes, they had annual reunions, and these were a big deal. I, I mentioned Cora Kent Bell at the beginning. She was very involved in creating an alumni association, and there was even a Massachusetts branch of the alumni association, so they stuck together, and we have lots and lots of photos of reunion pictures of the women who are together, and they, um, they take a picture of themselves, and they try to get the picture as they looked when they were girls in the same order. So these were very um, busy, and they, they kept it up, and they, they supported the school as well. The Alumni Association frequently would pay for repairs and things that needed to be done in the school. So yeah, they stuck together. The Alumni Association um, we closed about four or five years ago, I think. They, they left the Historical Society their remaining funds, and they gave us some of the silver that they used in their um, ceremonies. So we have that. Yeah. 
Is the Robinson who has completely gone? I mean, did it turn into the town? No, they decided in 1947, before reunification, that it could be used for general education, but it, it was sort of supposed to be supporting things just for girls. So, for instance, they used it to support the home economics program at Exeter High School for a long time. I'm not sure how they managed to do it now, but the Robinson Fund today is used for a variety of different educational resources. You can apply for grants, etc. I'm going to call on Jody. <laughs> Yes, there is a Robinson Fund. <laughs> In, in the Summerhill section of Georgia. He, he left money for another school, too. Um, I think that one was tied up a little bit with his um, the request for his wife. I think she, she, had to she had to die first, and then the securities would go to that school. But yes, he did support another school as well, which was not for just girls. Yes? trying to give it an element of, you know, like academy sounds so much better than school, right? And seminary was a kind way of saying that this is a, it's, it's an enriching environment, it is embracing, it is almost spiritual. That's why it's used for, you know, theological seminaries today. Um, I think it was just a trendy word of its time but a very powerful one. So using that word, seminary, it made it sound like, you know, your daughters are going to be well cared for while they're here. They're going to be encouraged. They're going to be embraced. This is, you know, it's a welcoming place. No, other seminaries can be, can be co-ed, yeah. It was just that particular movement whenever they created it, like a girls' school, it's usually called a seminary. Although Sanborn Academy, which wasn't all girls, but that's an academy in another town close by, frequently compared because of the architecture. Yes? Him. Okay. Yeah, girls from other towns did did come here. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so she's telling us about a 90-year-old who was involved in the um, Alumni Association who was from Nottingham, which is not terribly close. I mean, it is a close town, but not something that you'd want to commute to daily. Um, some girls came by the, uh, we had the streetcars that came through town until the 1920s. We had the railroad station that could bring you in from the New Market, New Fields, et cetera. So there were ways of getting into town if you were going to commute. Or, as some people did, as this, this woman did, she boarded in town during the week and went home on weekends. So although there, they didn't have a boarding house or a dormitory for out-of-town students, there were ways that you could attend. Okay, I think we're going to call it a night. It's after 8 o'clock. Thank you all for coming tonight. You can send me any questions you have. <laughs>